we've been doing a series about biblical support, meaning we're looking at the things that the Bible actually prescribes for the church to spend money on. There are some things that it tells us to use money for, and among them is this one, support of widows. We also saw in the scriptures, of course, that uh, paying preachers is required. They are laborers who have wages due. It is also in the scriptures that we honor elders, that elders are to be paid as well. And uh, here we find the support of widows. This is actually, uh, well, it's, it's both simple and complicated. So I'm going to start with the simple part. But uh, when, when I was putting this lesson together and had finished with the complicated part, my, my comment on that one when I filed it was, this is the longest aside I've ever taken. <laughs> uh, so we'll see about that um, in coming lessons. But today I do want to look at what they did in the New Testament with regard to widows as we look at what they used money for. Um, we know for sure that they did provide financial support for widows who were in the number of the congregation. We also know that it's not an unqualified support. They had to, there were certain conditions they had to meet. And this is coming from 1 Timothy chapter 5. It's in this place where we have well, lots of verses, but the outline is, is basically and kind of clearly between verses 3 and 16, which are the bookends on this account where you have truly widows on both sides. First is honor widows who are truly widows. And uh, it was, that's verse 3. It was previous lessons where we looked at the New Testament definition of honor. But honor means financial support. And uh, one of the places you can look that's pretty clear about that would be in, in Matthew 15, for example, uh, where the Pharisees ask Jesus, why don't your disciples wash their hands before they eat and thus break the tradition of the elders? And Jesus' response is, and why do you break the commandment of God by allowing people not to provide financial support for their aging mother and father? That's the rest of that account. You can see that honor means financial support. There are other places, so I don't want to belabor that point. But what it means is, okay, there are widows, and there are truly widows, and those that are truly widows should be honored, meaning that the church supports them. Then you see in verses 9 and 10, there are qualities that she must possess before she would be enrolled. Um, She's got to be no less than 60 years of age. Uh, among, there are other things there, and I don't think that's the focus today, so I have just put that in an ellipse. But let a widow be enrolled. That's pretty important. This idea of who is truly a widow is a bookmark on the, on the account, but this enrolled, that's a thing we're going to talk about here. And then, uh, you know, we have that 16th verse. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened, so that it may care for those who are truly widows. And so this is our definition. Uh, a widow who has family members who can support her should lead on those family members, not on the congregation. That's all that it's saying. But there are people who don't have family who will support them, who do not have others that care about them or are you know, repaying their debt at home. And the, that's what you're looking at here. The church can care for those who are truly widows. Now, what does it mean, let a widow be enrolled? Well, I can tell you that this word enrolled is uh, a singular word. It, there, it doesn't occur anywhere else in scripture, just this verse. And so uh, for that reason, I will go to a dictionary to, to uh, define it uh, instead of to the other verses where it's used. But in the dictionary, we find that the root of this word is this idea of recounting or telling at length, uh, you know, give all the gory details, give this complete account or reckoning here. 
um, conclu conclude by enumeration, which is a very English way of saying, you know, making a clear argument from multiple points, right? <laughs> Enumerate, draw up a list from which we get enroll or enlist or select. And so this word, uh, and I like select because L-E-C in lect is the same as L-E-G in lego, which is also in this verb. Um, but anyway, this uh, idea when you, you look at this definition about uh, recounting everything, reckoning um, in full, uh, you know, detailed enumeration, listed, uh, you get the idea, I think. The word is kind of describing what you need to do to take care of somebody, isn't it? There's a lot of work involved in providing for somebody who is in need. If you have an aging parent, you know. Um, there does have to be reckoning. There does ha somebody's got to pay attention to the details, and there has to be a full accounting for what's going on. Where, where, where are things going? What will be needed? When will that be needed? Can we get that ahead of time? Now, this is a word that you know, kind of fits that idea pretty well. So she's somebody who is enrolled, meaning that there's some kind of organization here, and I'm not preaching the organization gospel, <laughs> and it, uh, which may not be obvious unless you know me personally, but um, I'm saying that the word itself is telling us there's a lot of detail-oriented attention here. And the opposite of this is what we read about in Acts chapter 6, where it says that the widows were being overlooked. But this is kind of the opposite of overlooked. They're enrolled. Not only is somebody remembering to care about them, but it's actually perhaps written down in gory detail what needs to be done here. There might be a to-do list or something like that to care for this individual. So it tells us that they had a role, if you will, or they had a, you know, some kind of reckoning, some kind of record of who is going to be provided for financially by the church, which is perfectly New Testament-y. They did this, and it's detailed for us how they did this and the qualities of the person who would be so supported and the cases where even a person with those qualities would not be supported, i.e. when they have family who can care for them instead. But without further ado, let us look at Acts chapter 6. Now here, this also remains relatively simple. But there's a daily distribution in Acts 6, which is a, an interesting thing to take note of. I want to look at the account so we get a picture here. I think it's actually necessary to understand what's going on which is verses one through six. In these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Hellenists means Greeks, Greek-speaking Jews, which is gonna be, if you remember, this started on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter two, this thing that we're doing here. I, I understand that there are people who think it had something to do with North America and some guy named Campbell. That's hogwash. This started in Acts chapter 2. I never read about any of that in the Bible. Um, these are Greeks who came in Acts chapter 2 because they were, they were Jews in foreign countries who had come for the Pentecost and then they obeyed the gospel and they stayed those people were selling off their lands and donating the proceeds. You read in Acts chapter 4. Well, here we are in Jerusalem, thousands of people, both native Judeans and the Jews who had come there and stayed there from many foreign countries, 
And the reason why that would be Hellenist or Greek is that Greek was the common language. When you were a foreigner, when you were a merchant, a traveler, you spoke Greek. That was the common tongue, the common language. And that is also the reason why the New Testament is written in Greek. It's the normal, everyday, mercantile language. So these foreigners who have sold off all their stuff and are now living in Jerusalem because the church is here and it's that important to them to be with God, have a complaint. Their widows are being neglected in the daily distribution. Now, it's interesting that there is such a thing as a daily distribution. There is. Meaning they, every day, they saw to it that they were caring for these widows that we read about in 1 Timothy 5. And of course, that means that 1 Timothy 5 is written in retrospect of the rule. This is the letter to Timothy reminding him what the rules are. But the rules have existed from long before 1 Timothy. They're from Jerusalem. Acts 6, uh, 1 through 6, again, they're being neglected, meaning they're being overlooked. They're, they're getting missed. Now, you can see what's wrong with this, right? Right? The thing that Satan is threatening to do here, right, is racism, right? Classism. Right, a a tiered citizenship. The, The Jerusalem Jews are, you know, higher class citizens than the foreign born Jews. That's what Satan is trying to do. Which, of course, the Holy Spirit nips in the bud. The twelve summon the full number of the disciples, meaning everybody come, not just Hebrews and not just Greeks. Their word is, it's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven husbands of good repute, And yes, it says husbands. I know your translation says men. It is wrong. Pick out from among you seven husbands of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we, the apostles, will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministering of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, who chose seven Greek names. Stephen, a man full of faith and the spirit, Philip, Prochorus, well, okay, so maybe some of these. Nicanor, Timon, or Timon, Parmenas, Nicolaus, a proselyte from Antioch. These they set before the apostles who prayed and laid hands on them, meaning they're approved, they're appointed. All right. So we now have seven men appointed to oversee this work of the daily distribution. Well, it's an interesting thing what you're seeing then in the New Testament. The apostles functioning as elders, appointed deacons, these individuals who are to be in charge of that work. They need to attend to this matter, it said. They're to be in charge of that work, which is the daily distribution. They have widows among them who are in need, whom the church supports. And it is the work of these deacons to do the detailed things that we read about in 1 Timothy 5. They are the ones that are making sure that the food actually gets there, that she can open a can if she needs to open a can or come safely down the stairs or whatever it is that they need to be able to subsist. This is part of support there. They are going and they are using um, funds from the treasury to provide for the widows in their care. They do this daily, it says. That is an interesting thing. That was, you know, kind of the original reason for which they established deacons. And you think about this, that the church really was, and and I I shouldn't say was, but it is, um, it's a a loving, uh, positive, safe place. 
the people of God are good and they are kind. And this is a whole kind of system set up by the Holy Spirit, legislated by God, to take care of the most vulnerable parts of society, which is really neat. Uh, and that's a wonderful thing and a blessing that shouldn't be overlooked if you are a Christian. To think that that was the reason for which they established deacons and that was what the deacons did. Well, let's look at some of the other things that we read there. It said in these days, verse one said, when the disciples were increasing in number. It's important to note the number, not because we number the people as David did, uh, but because it's important to understand what it means to pick out seven. Acts chapter 2, verse 41, it records for us, that's where we started. Those who received his word were baptized, which is the same today. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So some 3,000 persons obeyed the gospel in Acts chapter 2. Then the fourth chapter, verse 4, says many of those who had heard the word believed, which is after they do the miracle of uh, healing the man who had been lame from birth, the 40-year-old who had been lame from birth, sitting at the gate of the temple. He now can leap uh, for joy and enter the temple with them. After this, those who heard the word believed. And the number, many of those who heard it believed, the number of the men came to about 5,000. The number of the husbands came to about 5,000. That means 5,000 families. Which is, what's that? That's something like 10,000 people, isn't it? I don't know what the actual statistic is for your multiplier times, you know, husband, but it's probably double, maybe more than double in a typical society. And then in chapter 5, verse 12 says they were together, they were all together in Solomon's portico. Well, this is an outdoor gathering. There's, there's a porch, if you will, which is kind of like something like what we would call a stage where, from which they can do their teaching and their preaching and the people are just, you know, in the courtyard, if you will, and by the thousands, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, where else are you going to put 10,000 people? And the 14th verse says, more than ever believers were added to the Lord. Multitudes of men and women both. More than ever, they were added. Multitudes of them. Well, how many is this? Well, you know, the numbers that we were given was 5,000 husbands in chapter 3, which is, like I said, something like probably 10,000 people, maybe more, maybe 15,000. And here in Acts 5, 14, we're told that more than ever they were added to the Lord, multitudes of men and women both, which seems to indicate we're talking about thousands more. How many people are we talking about here, right? It's not just, you know, this congregation of 30 people or even 3,000 people. It's several times that amount. And then... On the other end of Acts 6, after this episode with the uh, widows and the deacons, you see verse 7, the word of God continued to increase. The number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Which is to say, when we do God's things in God's ways, then we have God's outcomes. Right? This is good. It was an encouragement to them, and it was an encouragement to the world around them who could see this was a kinder, gentler system where people did things, you know, by hand, <laughs> daily, caring for one another. That's good. So that's one thing, but when you start thinking about, well, seven, they appointed seven deacons. Well, how many elders were there? Well, the 12 apostles, and there's not all 12 of them, right? More like 10. Um, then you got seven deacons. Well, how many people are we talking about? I mean, you know, is it is it 10,000 people? Is it 7,000 people? Uh, even if it's 7,000 people, which doesn't sound right at all from what we read. One deacon per thousand? 
It sounds like it could be one deacon per 3,000. So what does that mean? Is he the one that's going around doing this every day for everybody in? No, obviously not. He's overseeing that work. Not that he's an elder, he's overseeing a specific you know, task, a, a business at hand of distributing support. And you find that they did this for evangelists too. Philippi would send their deacons to Paul to give him his support from them. They didn't have PayPal, you know. <laughs> but whatever it was, you know, and you say, well, we don't, we don't have to use PayPal. We can take it. Yes, you can, but your deacons can also sign you up for PayPal and administer that to ensure that there's a support delivery mechanism. That's what deacons do. That's what they're for. In this case, it's obvious they would have been what we might call directors or managers. Not that they themselves necessarily did all the work by hand, but that they oversaw the work. They made sure that there was order to it, that there was accounting for it, that they knew that it was being done and that the widow's needs were being met. Right? Whatever that takes. And I'm sure that this also means delegation. They must have assigned service to other members of the church who could go and do this themselves. All right, you know, you, my brother, you're going to take food over there. You, my sister, this, this woman needs a delivery, but she doesn't need help opening cans or getting down the stairs. And so you deliver the food over there, right? There was somebody who oversaw that. It was deacons. That's what they did. And I'm sure they did some delivery themselves, but you get the idea. There's no way that they genuinely, you know, went around procuring the goods and delivering them to every single widow among thousands of people. They must have been overseeing this work and delegating it to others. They were managing this work. Now, what about the word overlooked? Let's talk about that. It said that their widows were being overlooked. Uh, this word also is, uh, only occurs here. And the definition in the dictionary is to compare things, examine something next to another thing. But the other side of that, the negative side of that, is to take slight notice of or overlook. Right, as in, there's a comparison here, but they, the two don't compare. <laughs> Which is exactly what we were saying earlier, that there seems to be this kind of two-tiered class system where the Hebrews are first-class citizens and the Hellenists are second-class citizens. When you put them side by side and compare, they don't compare. That's a slight notice, an overlook. That's the charge. That's the fear, if you will, or that's the threat. When the church does not ensure that things are being done, that the work that God has assigned us to do is actually being done. The result of that will be first class and second class citizens in the kingdom of God. Right, the, the result will be somebody's needs are not met. Somebody is overlooked. Somebody is, you know, perhaps becoming upset, be seething. And, you know, with reason, you might argue. It isn't just. It isn't fair. And we've been told by God what it is we're supposed to do about this and what our charge is to do about this. So, yeah, it would be unjust if, if that happened. So, you know, what might that be today? Well, I mean, it could be any of a number of things. Uh, we may well have widows that we need to care for, and this would be exactly how you do it, because that's what the New Testament says. What I would say about this would be something like the, um, the meeting notes, for example, um, or, you know, the financial statements, uh, the... Uh, the budgeting, the, uh, you know, all of these kinds of things are things that should be in the hands of every member, including 
widows, if you will, including those who maybe can't get out of the house or you know, those who are not present or part of those discussions about whatever those matters might be, that information should be shared with everybody. Everybody should have it. Uh, and why not? Because what you end up with, if they don't, is a schism between classes of citizenship, those who are in the know and those who are not in the know, right? those whose voices are heard and those who have no voice. That's, you don't want that. That's just an example. But you can see how that's playing out, and that's what's happening here in Acts chapter 6. And you can see the threat that Satan is holding over the church there. That could do a lot of damage. Um, the complaint thing that they raised. It says complaint, but actually um, this word is less complaint. It's more murmuring, or grumbling, muttering. And it's, it's a word that we call onomatopoeia, which you may or may not know. It's a fun word, which means a word that sounds like the thing that it describes in Greek. It's gongosmos. Gongo, gongo, gongo. Right? Sounds like, sounds like controversy, doesn't it? Some, well, I don't know about that. You know, that sound, which also is like doves cooing. <laughs> it's that sound, right? You say something up there and then that murmur. That's what they're talking about. There's murmuring. Here's a good definition passage. It's John 7. And I'm using this one. This is just a definition. It's not related to Acts 6 directly, but it defines murmuring, grumbling. There was much muttering, that's the word, about Jesus among the people. While some said, he's a good man. Others said, no, he's leading the people astray. But for fear, no one spoke openly. That is murmuring. No, I mean, I think he's really good. Why, why would you say that? No, he's just, you know, he disturbs the people. He's misleading the people. Oh, here they come. Shh. Hi. <laughs> That's what's happening. That's the murmur, right? It's, you have this strongly held opinion that you share selectively with individuals, not everybody. And when authority comes, you all clam up. Yep, that's how it goes in the world, isn't it? That's what was happening. This murmuring arose. You can see the widows are not, are they, you know, nobody took care of widow, you know, whatever, Papadopoulos. And so, you know, well, why not? I, well, I don't, I don't know. It might have been a mistake, you know. And then the next day, like, well, I bet it's because, you know, they don't know how to spell her last name. They don't know the Greek alphabet. You know, and then it starts getting, it goes from there, right? Grumbling. But then when the disciples are, or the apostles are around, uh, oh, you know, everything's good. Uh, not so. <laughs> Eventually it came to their ears, right? Now here's the other thing. In Philippians 2, here's another example of the word, which I think is useful to us because you can see the, uh, I guess, the contrast here. Philippians 2 is a good example of contrast. He says in verses 14 to 16, do everything without grumbling or disputing so that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Right. If we can take these actions without grumbling, without disputing, there's no dispute because it's being done rightly, justly, fairly, openly. Then we are blameless and innocent. We are children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and a twisted generation. And you know, you know, uh, maybe not everybody knows, not all the young people know, but everybody like me with gray in the beard knows Anywhere you have a pot of money being distributed, you have corruption. That's human nature, right? So this is where he's saying, if you're doing this and you're doing it according to the spirit, without grumbling, without disputing, you're blameless and innocent. 
You're without blemish in the midst of a crooked and a twisted generation. It's true. This would never happen outside of the church. I had a, a complaint at work one time about a product that the management wanted to acquire. And I was telling my manager, look, like, look this is ridiculous. They're doing this because these contractors are saying it's a good idea, but it's really expensive. We could build something like this, much less expensive. And, and he said to me, all cereal has rat feces in it. <laughs> it's a question of how much, which is true. Unfortunately, that's true. There is a, a, a USDA acceptable percentage of rat feces in your cereal. That's true. Um, it's a question of how much. But what he's saying is right. In human affairs, they are twisted, they are crooked. But in the church, it is not so. Uh, in, uh, in contrast to this, you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, that in the day of Christ I may be proud. I didn't run in vain or labor in vain. I went out to Philippi, and these people obeyed the gospel. We got, we got ourselves a church there. These are the real people of God. You also have 1 Peter 4 about service, and it really does tie back to Acts 6. See, we're going. We're getting there. 1 Peter 4, 8 through 11, he says, Keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling, as each has received a gift, use it, to serve one another as good stewards of the various gifts God has given. Whoever has the ability to speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Whoever has the ability to serve, let him serve with the strength that God supplies. And other things in this list, on down the list. But the serve there is the same word about the service that is rendered by the deacons. It's the same word as the service that is called the daily distribution, which we'll get to in a moment. But understand, when I read 1 Peter 4, 8 through 11, now it occurs to me, this may well be something that Peter wrote in retrospect of what happened in Acts 6. Don't you think? He says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Right? You got foreigners who've sold their land and are living here, and you're caring for them. Right? Show hospitality without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve as good stewards of the various things God has given. If you can speak, you speak as the oracles of God. If you can serve, then serve with God's strength to serve, meaning it doesn't wear you out to do what God wants. Your energy is renewed knowing that you're working for the Lord. But I think this might be in retrospect. Love covers a multitude of sins, meaning, hey, you know, a lot of things had to not go the way they should have gone, for this grumbling, you know, to well up and turn into what it did in Acts chapter 6 and how Satan had the church in the crosshairs. Hmm. All right. Well, we're not going to take the entire uh, aside because this, this is the thing. This is the longest aside I've ever written. We're not going to take the, the aside, but I am going to get, finish out this lesson. <laughs> uh, diakonia is the Greek word there. That's uh, through the dust. Through the dust, which is, you know, that's where we get deacon from, right? There's our D. That's actually an I, but we say E-A-C-O-N. Deacon. <laughs> Deaconry. Deaconship. Deacon Rick, I don't know, what, we don't have a word for it. Service. Service is probably the best translation because we have servers, right, who bring things to the table. Those are diakona in, in Greek. Um, they're the people that get dirty. They go through the dust. That's what it means. <laughs> servers, uh, 
who render service or who serve. Right? These are all the same root through the dust. And they are the words that are used here. Right in Acts 6, 1, the Hebrews are uh, widows, are be, or I'm sorry, the, the Hellenist widows are being neglected in the daily diakona, or diakonia. That is the uh, distribution, but it's the service. The, the daily service. Which is also in verse 2, where the apostles said, it's not right to give up teaching the word of God to serve tables, which is just the verb form of deacon. To deaconate. The word tables does not occur there in Greek. It's to deaconate. <laughs> which means to get dirty, to, to, go, to be a servant of manual labor. We should not give up preaching the word of God to be going around delivering food from house to house. There needs to be a separation of duties here. Everything has to be done. Rather, in verse 4, the apostles devote themselves to prayer and to the deaconing of the word. Now that's an interesting thing, the deaconing or the service of the word. So it's interesting. The deacons are literally serving tables by taking literal food to literal widows' houses. The apostles are figuratively serving tables by serving up the feast that is the word of God for our souls, the bread come down from heaven. That's pretty cool. <laughs> but immediately, what they've done is said there's two different kinds of service. There, there is a literal service and there is a spiritual service too. And as you get to thinking about things that come in twos in the Bible, you realize love your neighbor as yourself is a literal service. And love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength is a spiritual one. And these are the two commandments that summarize five each of the ten. Hmm. We probably have to come back to this, but let me go quickly on 1 Timothy 3. There is one place where we are told what the deacons are supposed to be like. And you know why, in retrospect, right? Verse 8 to 13. They must be dignified, not double-tongued, meaning they're not two-faced, not addicts, not greedy for dishonest gain. In retrospect of, we are giving them money from the treasury with which they acquire goods and services on behalf of the widows of the church every day, it's kind of obvious why they have to be dignified, not two-faced, not addicts, not greedy for dishonest gain. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? That's not the person that you hand money to. <laughs> and they must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. It's a work of the faith. They have to have faith. Let them also be first tested and let them serve as deacons if proven blameless. Their wives too must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober. So, well, sober-minded, which is wrong. It's teetotaler, abstinent from alcohol. Faithful in all things. Let deacons be monogamous, managing their children and their own households well. You understand how all of this makes sense. This is a married man who has children. Perhaps, for that matter, if he's going to somebody's home and he actually has to go inside, he probably should take one of the kids or his wife with him. Not, don't go into somebody else's unmarried home by yourself as a husband. That's not wise. Those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and great confidence in the faith in Christ Jesus. Yeah, that office is a, is a wonderful thing. A good standing for themselves and confidence in the faith. You know what God is saying. You are the, 
if you will, you're that providential arm of God for his children, for his most needy. So your faith, your trust in God grows. That's a great thing. Finally, Matthew 20, I uh, talk about the invitation that heaven has for you, not my invitation. Verses 26 to 28, Jesus said, whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to serve, not to be served, but to serve, and to give his own life a ransom for the many. And that includes me. All of us have need to be forgiven. All of us have need for our sins to be taken away, that we might stand in the day of judgment. And Jesus is the one who has paid this price for us. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. It is true. He lived a humble life. He did good for everybody around him. He touched so many lives and all of it in positive ways, only doing what was good and right and upbuilding for people. And yet we esteemed him stricken and we killed him. But he willingly gave his life as a servant and he redeems us. We did these things in ignorance but we can obtain forgiveness. If today you are not yet a Christian, you can be forgiven. God will reconcile, reconcile you to himself through his son, who is the sacrifice on your behalf. Here we have water prepared that you might be baptized in the name of Jesus for forgiveness of sins, which is exactly what we read in Acts chapter two when they first started. That hasn't changed. You are still putting to death the old person, burying them properly in water, and being resurrected in the Spirit of Christ. You're resurrected in new life, a Christian, a child of God, having washed away every sin and being ready for the judgment day. If you're not a Christian, we stand ready to help you. There's nothing that will stop you from obeying the gospel as we have water ready. If you are a Christian but have not lived right with God, repent, make things right with him before it is too late. But if we can help you with our prayers, we'll do it. I'd be encouraged. I'm certainly not above temptation. I don't know anybody who is or who's claiming that they are. Uh, we need each other. We pray for each other. We said at the outset that the church is, is very clearly and by legislation from God a kind and loving place where it is safe to be right with him. It is safe to confess him. So we're glad to pray with you and for you. If you need our prayers today, if you need to obey the gospel, let that need be known now by coming to the front while together we stand and sing the song selected.